Sarah, do you want to start us off or should I? Yes, I'm going to start. So thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Again, uh, my name is Sarah Layton. I am chapter director for Sierra Club Maine. Um, just a couple logistical things. Um, we ask that you remain muted while you're on the call. Um, we recommend that you watch this in uh, gallery view um, so that you can see all of our panelists. Um, this is being recorded and is live on Facebook. So if you don't want to be seen, we recommend turning off your video. Um, if you need help with that, just put that in the chat and we are happy to help you. Um, and we thank our sponsors, our lead sponsors for this evening, which is um, New England Aquaventus and Revision Energy. And I'm going to pass it along to our chapter chair, Sue Levine. That's me. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming. That um, It's nice to see all these faces and all these people. It gets pretty lonely during COVID. I hope that you're all well and healthy and coping as best as you can. Um, that this is a nice way for us to at least get together virtually. I miss our annual dinner when we're in person, but there's a silver lining in that you, we didn't have to drive anywhere. So that's kind of nice too. Um, I just want to take a moment and for all of us to just be grateful for, for the election wins that we did have, both the, our local representatives and senators and um, our federal races that we won. And I want to thank the people. I know there's a bunch of people on this call who have done yeoman's work in sending out letters and making phone calls and organizing people and going out and voting and doing all the stuff that made that happen. And without, without all of us, these, these wins wouldn't have been as likely. So, so thank you for that. Um, and then I also want to thank the, our events team that has put this great program together. I hope that you enjoyed the film. If you weren't able to watch the film yet, it's not a problem. You can do that after this that there is no deadline on the film. So if you didn't get to watch it or you only watch some of it or want to watch it again, you can just put that password back in the link and that will work for you. Um, I guess as, as we um, listen to the panel and ask questions that I think that I would like everyone to think about all the work that there is still to do and that, and how we can do that together. That, you know, we are more, that, one person trying to do all the work, nothing happens. But when we all work together, we can be a powerful force for advocating for climate justice and social justice and the environment. Um, and I hope that we here at Sierra Club Maine, we want to do our best to be a welcoming community for all those who are doing this work. So, so thank you for being here. And with that, we have a few awards we'd like to give out. I'm gonna pass it over to Becky, who is a longtime club leader and just an all around awesome person. Go ahead, Becky. Uh-oh, oh yeah. I, I have unmuted. Great, I couldn't unmute, thank you. Um, hi everyone. Um, we annually do give out awards to a number of um, people. We have a, a series of awards to give tonight. Um, but I wanna just uh, say thank you. So I also thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to start with um, the leader, the journalism award, which is um, we don't give the journalism award all that often, but we want to recognize Jim Frick, who is somewhere here. I wish you would wave your hand, um, but you're, I can't even see you. Um, Jim Frick has been a has always been a member of the um, the team since I joined uh, years ago and has been the editor of the um, Maine Sierra since 2000. Uh, he's, he has uh, done stellar writing research and has been an incredible editor of that, of our, of our paper news. And um, it's really, it, it is an, a phenomenal amount of work that he has done and we just cannot thank him enough, enough for that work. And in addition, he has also taken on our e-news. Um, Jim has um, a number of times tried to step down and we haven't let him do it this time. Um, he has um, graciously requested that he could um, do some other work for the chapter and is doing some other um, uh, work in the Maine Woods area. But uh, we really wanna thank you, Jim. Um, every month you work tirelessly to uh, not only spread news about Sierra Club Maine on our work, 
to our communities, but also to help educate and inform the over 20,000 members and supporters we have. Your leadership um, and commitment to journalism is phenomenal and will definitely be missed. Thank you so much for the work that you've done. And your award is coming. <laughs> Um, next, I would like to honor the um, members of the Maine Youth Climate Justice Group who have, um, I, there are at least these number of people on the call and I may be missing someone, but Josh Wood, uh, can you wave your wave? Um, Nina Lehman, Grace Bernaches, Luke Sakara, wherever she and uh, wherever he is, and I don't think Anna Siegel is on the call. Um, Josh is an organizer for Black Lives Matter Maine and has worked with us on climate justice training. Um, Nina is a climate justice intern and Grace is a Maine youth climate justice uh, intern as well. Um, Luke Sakara not only works with the Maine Youth Climate Justice, but also has served on our political team uh, this year as a volunteer in the political team when doing endorsements. Um, it's our honor to, to um, give present you with the Sierra Club's 2020 Grassroots Leadership Award for the work you've done in climate justice and action. Um, our executive committee, along with the entire membership, congratulates you on your outstanding leadership and commitment to protecting our planet for generations to come. As a youth coalition composed, composed of individuals from across the state of Maine, your critical work demanding climate and social justice epitomizes how grassroots groups, grassroots groups can be leaders for change. And this is exactly how the Sierra Club operates. And we just salute you for doing the work that you've done. Um, you've worked tirelessly to influence the um, Maine Climate Council, endorse progressive climate forward candidates, and support Black Lives Matter movement, as well as uplifting new voices that need to be heard here in Maine. We applaud your ambition and willingness to push organizations, including ours, to be bolder and to focus on climate justice solutions. We would like to thank you for your important leadership in tackling climate justice and climate change as an issue. Uh, economic justice, racial justice, and political justice in order to truly address the climate crisis, we know that we must get to the root of the problem. Thank you for your efforts to shed light on how systemic issues play out in the state of Maine. We look forward to continuing to support your work and uplifting each other on the long road ahead. On behalf of our members and all the people in Maine, congratulations and thank you for leading the way for change. Or you can also do this. And last but certainly not least, um, our legislative leadership award is another award we don't always give out. And um, we it's it's to two legislative leaders, Nicole Grahovsky and Seth Barry. We, it's our honor um, to present you with the Sierra Club 2020 Legislative Award for your work in the 20, uh, 129th uh, Maine Legislature. Sierra Club Maine is executive committee along with our entire membership. Congratulate you for your outstanding leadership and commitment to our mission to explore, enjoy and protect the planet. Sierra Club Maine chapter is pleased to recognize your dedication to transform Maine's monopoly investor owned utilities to consumer ownership. This transition promises to open the door to rapid decarbonization of the economy by facilitating beneficial electrification through an entity that is responsive to Mainers rather than financial investors. Your pioneering work on this and other energy sector issues before the Joint Standing Committee of Energy Utilities and Technology, EUT, has prop propelled them to the forefront of policymaking in an area of central importance to achieving Maine's climate goals and building a clean energy economy for the 21st century. We also congratulate both of you on your recent reelection to the 130th Maine legislature and look forward to working with you both in the coming years. On behalf of our members and all the people in Maine, congratulations and thank you for your service and for leading the way for change. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate your coming and I hope you will enjoy the program.
Thanks, everyone. I'm going to hop in. My name is Kelsey Johnson. I'm on the XCOM uh, for Sierra Club Maine. I'm the executive director of Space in Portland. Um, we also, th congratulations to everybody we just gave awards to. They've been fabulous. And also, all the people you just heard from are also fabulous leaders, Becky, Sue, Sarah. Um, it's been a really exciting year here at the chapter, and we're really excited to tell you all a little bit more about it. Um, this has been a huge year. We came on with a new director, Sarah. We also have um, three staff, um, Matt Cannon, who joined us previously and has stepped up into some really exciting advocacy and legislative roles and just had a nice big win for Jared Golden uh, in District 2, uh, Marina Bach, and uh, also Anya Wright. And, uh, you know, the chapter is really expanding. We're super proud and excited about this work. Um, and uh, I hope you've been joining us for some of our other community conversations. There's a lot of other XCOM members on here that have been leading them. Um, and we hope to share a little bit of that uh, kind of programming tone tonight with this amazing panel discussion. Um, the film tomorrow was really beautiful. And as Sarah said, she was uh, looking for the charge to find a film that was optimistic about all the great work that we're doing and not just an environmental documentary. Uh, that was painful. Again, if you haven't watched it, um, we're going to just talk about the themes and these kind of amazing community leaders are on the call with us to, to discuss the themes in the work, but all of you who are here can watch it for free. I really recommend it. It's a good, uh, it's a good bomb to all the chaos of the past couple weeks and, and moving forward into a new era. Um, so I'm really proud to, uh, to introduce our uh, exciting panelists and um, they can unmute themselves. We're going to ask everybody to uh, turn off your video just so since we will have quite a few people on the call for now. Um, I'm hoping at the end of the panel we can all turn our videos back on and give them a little round of applause. Um, and um, so, uh, oh, and also if you have questions for our panelists, please put them into the chat. Matt Cannon from our staff is going to be looking at them and he'll ask them follow up questions as well. Um, so, we have Amara Efeji, the Grassroots Development Coordinator of Maine Environmental Education Association, Isabel Estevez, the Senior Policy Advisor of a Living Economy for Sierra Club, Johanna Bozua, the Climate and Energy Program Co-Manager of the Democracy Collective, John Brodigan, uh, the attorney and the former state representative from 2004 to 2008, and also a fellow XCOM member of Sierra Club Maine, and then Kate Wallace, the program director of Resilience Hub. Um, and they are going to be here talking about different themes, including education, economy, renewable energy, democracy, and urban agriculture, which are all themes in the film. Um, each is going to present for five minutes, and then we'll have a panel discussion with all of them following up. Um, we're really excited to have them on this call and, you know, the film and what each of them represents is that we truly need an intersectional grassroots coalition to move forward. Um, so we're going to kick it off with Amara and uh, some thoughts about education here in Maine. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, so as Kelsey said, my name is Amara and I'm the grassroots development coordinator with um, Maine Environmental Education Association. Um, and so, of course, um, that is my role. But first and foremost, I'm a student. I go to Northeastern um, and I'm studying philosophy, politics and economics. I don't tell people that because it's kind of a mouthful. But um, I would say first, starting with education, I think of my education experience in Maine, learning about climate change or um, rather, in my case, a lack thereof. Um, every single climate change, climate justice oriented, um, everything that I sought was self-sought in that I didn't really learn anything in school. I mean, I would not count recess as um, environmental education or as climate education, um, but that's pretty much all that I had. And although um, I would have just so loved to have um, to have had that kind of education. I am very grateful that I self sought those opportunities because I got to learn about climate change, not through a scientific context of, you know, this is a graph of CO2 trends over the past hundred years or something, but instead about how climate justice is really a movement for the people and that it's impacting people's lives. And that is the urgency around it, not numbers, but what those numbers are doing to individuals and the disparity when, within this crisis. Um, and so in self-seeking these uh, learning opportunities, um, I think I was 16, 
um, when I first um, attended the Maine Environmental Education Association's uh, fall gathering. And so there, um, I really was made aware of the disparities between um, climate justice um, and the racial justice crisis, as well as um, so many other intersectional uh, social justice issues that are linked with climate change. Um, and I became so impassioned by the issue um, for environmental learning, for climate justice and advocating for it. Um, and so um, actually the um, when I attended the gathering, I didn't real I didn't know that three years later I would be actually working for for Mia. Um, but that's actually how it came to be full circle. Um, and so now in this role, um, we're really advocating for policy level change. Um, Mia is extremely collaborative in nature, and so it collaborates with another um, environmental entity, the Nature Based Education Consortium, and together they really just have a common goal of. Um, environmental and climate justice education for all Maine youth. And so um, because of this, um, the Nature-Based Education Consortium and a task force that I am part of, the Climate Change Education Task Force, um, it submitted recommendations to the Maine um, Climate Council around climate change education for K through 12 youth. And um, it was definitely um, a feat that we did not think um, we could even accomplish at the beginning of our task force, the conception of it. Um, but we not only are were these recommendations submitted, but they were very much so positively received by the members of the Maine Climate Council, which we were so grateful for. Um, alongside this, um, Mia also has other grassroots level environmental education initiatives, such as um, this mini grant that we just launched um, on teacher appreciation or educator appreciation day. Um, and so it was very eye opening to see how much funding and how much need there is. Um, educators were writing reports on, you know, this is what the school needs in order to implement these, these practices in order to have their, their kids be able to connect with the environment. And so um, today we had our final meeting, just narrowing down, um, you know, who gets the funding. And um, according to metrics, it looks like we're hitting about one seventh of all main public schools who are receiving this funding, which just makes my heart so warm. Um, and so this is the work that I am doing at um, the Maine Environmental Education Association. And there's just so much need for education, really, because if young folks, if, if students have a connection to place with the environment, then they're going to be prompted and compelled to act on it, to make sure that mother nature is being treated that the way she, that she is supposed to be treated, being preserved the way she's supposed to be preserved. Um, and so I guess that's my little spiel and um, I will pass it off to um, Kelsey to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Amara. Um, it takes all different kinds of educational initiatives on every different age group, demographic. Uh, it's really um, tremendously important work and part of kind of the advocacy awareness building. And we're going to talk about that more in the Q&A. So this will be a little, uh, <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Isabel next. Um, who is joining us to talk about the economy um, and her work as a policy advisor. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And thank you so much for having me and especially also for sharing uh, this film with us because it really, it brought me a much needed dose of optimism uh, by reminding me of all the concrete experiences around the world uh, that show that economic transformation is not only possible, that it's already happening and that it's well underway. Um, so what I wanted to do with my five minutes is talk a little bit about the, the interface between local experiences, like the ones that were showcased in the film, and the federal policies for economic transformation that we're pushing for in our campaign for economic renewal um, at the Living Economy Program, where I'm senior policy advisor. Um, and I, I'd say, first of all, that the way that we've been approaching policy design and, and advocacy in, in our program is by thinking and trying to envision federal policies that are both ambitious and aimed at solving national and global challenges like climate change, and at the same time are designed to support and to scale up locally rooted initiatives like the ones we saw in the film, um, instead of imposing top-down policies that don't really lend themselves to being tailored to the needs of particular people, which is so often the case. So that's the, the broad policy challenge that we're constantly trying to solve for. 
Um, and it's also what we've tried to reflect in the, the vision for economic transformation that we've laid out in the Thrive Agenda, which I wanna talk about a little bit. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar with it, the, the Thrive Agenda is a, it's a comprehensive vision for economic renewal that's accompanied by an investment plan to put 16 million people back to work over the next 10 years, uh, building an economy that prioritizes racial, economic, and climate justice. Um, and to build cross-movement unity and momentum for an economic renewal package that can make Thrive real, uh, earlier this year we co-led the development of a Thrive Congressional Resolution, which has gained uh, support from over 100 members of Congress and over 250 of the largest union, racial justice, climate, and other grassroots groups around the country. Uh, Chuck Schumer even pledged that Thrive would be a Thrive Reliant legislation would be a top priority for 2021. So we'll be working hard to, to keep leadership accountable on that. In terms of what Thrive would mean in terms of economic transformation, I do want to share some numbers, uh, hopefully meaningful numbers. Uh, first, uh, the econo uh, economists have estimated that an investment plan based on Thrive would create nearly 16 million jobs and sustain them for the next decade. That means that Thrive would create enough jobs for all of the 14 million people that are currently unemployed in the US and would essentially eliminate the unemployment crisis. Second, those jobs would cover all sectors of the economy. We'd have 5 million jobs going to rebuild our broken infrastructure, over 4 million jobs to expand clean renewable energy and energy efficiency, over 4 million jobs investing in land restoration and regenerative agriculture, and over 2 million jobs supporting the care economy and vital public services. And of those, about 1.5 million are going to manufacturing to help revitalize our, our high skill manufacturing base. And it's also worth highlighting that Thrive isn't just calling for jobs, but calling for high quality jobs that would offer safe workplaces, family sustaining wages and benefits and access to unions. And it also calls for equitable access to those jobs, um, prioritizing communities in greatest need and incorporating standards for equitable hiring, community benefit agreements and community governance and control of investment. So that's the economic renewal that Thrive is calling for. And to make it real, in the next few months, we'll be working to, to get four policies across the finish line. The first would be a Thrive-esque economic recovery package with five to $10 trillion going to job creating investments that prioritize climate, racial, and economic justice. Second, a bill to create a new investment institution that we need to mobilize capital strategically and at the scale that we need for economic renewal. And that's where we're working really hard to design an institution that can ensure that money is going directly to communities to replicate and scale up good local initiatives that are already happening. Uh, third, we're working on a buy clean bill, a bill for government procurement that requires companies to disclose and to limit their industrial pollution in order to sell goods to the US government. Uh, the US government spends about $2 trillion every year on goods and services. So we wanna make sure that those are sustainable goods and services that create quality jobs and benefit workers and communities more than corporations. And finally, to make sure that we're being consistent with this vision for economic transformation in our economic relationships with the rest of the world, we're also working to establish a bill, um, on a bill to establish a new climate friendly trade model that raises environmental standards and labor standards both at home and around the world and reverses bad trade deals that have only made it worse and easier to, to poison communities. So that in a nutshell is our agenda for economic transformation. Super happy to delve into any of that uh, in the Q&A. And thanks again so much for having me. Back to you, Kelsey. Thank you so much, Isabel. And thanks for joining us from across the country. Um, and it's a really inspiring vision that I think has taken on some extra urgency with the financial recession we're now seeing with COVID. And um, I hope that we can continue to gain some popular traction with what that uh, economic and environmental vision look like. Um, thank you so much. And next up, um, we have Johanna from the Democracy Collaborative. Um, I'm excited to turn uh, it over to her to talk about uh, the role of renewable energy uh, in this movement. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelsey, and thank you to Isabel and Amara. Um, also, I'm sure that like these pieces will intersect us as we're speaking. And um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me on this call. Um, so yes, I, I'm Johanna and I work for a think tank organization called the Democracy Collaborative, um, which is really about 
addressing systemic crises through bold thinking um, that's like grounded in economic justice. So, um, you know, the, the piece of the Isabel brings um, around the economy um, and connecting that in my case uh, at the Democracy Collaborative to um, the new energy system that we're creating. Um, and, you know, I think as both Amara and Isabella pointed out, like right now we are operating within an extractive energy economy um, where uh, not only are we extracting from the ground, um, we are um, communities that are the least off um, are the, and uh, largely, you know, black, brown and indigenous communities are those um, who are holding the burden of our infrastructure, of our pollution, um, and also the ultimate impacts of climate change that are already starting to occur. Um, and so how, as Isabel has already mentioned as well, it's clear that like this issue of renewable energy is like not one of solely CO2. Um, it's about how our political economy um, created a context for this. And so um, I think that's actually like super grounding and important in terms of how we think about how we're re-envisioning our renewable energy system. Um, things that I know are already on the ground starting to happen in, in Maine. And um, we have so much to do when it comes to this renewable energy uh, transition and transformation. We have to you know, um, deploy a huge amount of, you know, community renewable energy, you know, um, solar on rooftops. We need to um, overhaul our buildings. I know Portland, Maine just passed um, a very cool uh, Green New Deal um, focused on housing. Um, we need to think about how we're going to rewire um, and electrify our landscape um, and how we build something that's resilient to the realities of climate change. Um, and that is all like huge, like technological um, pieces that we have to do. And in order to do those things, we are confronted with like structural um, pieces that stop that from happening. Um, and so we have to consider like the, the, those structural issues of the political economy in order to um, tackle the new, new renewable energy transition. And in particular, make sure that transition to renewable energy is one that is more just and more sustainable on the long term. And a concept that I use um, often and is uh, emerging across the United States and uh, globally is this concept of energy democracy. Um, and this, uh, really what renewable or what energy democracy is, is both about resisting fossil fuels um, and transitioning to renewable energy, but doing that in a way that put com puts community in control in the driver's seat and distributes that wealth and distributes that opportunity. Um, and that means that we actually have to confront the systems of power that we have now so that we can put something that's better in place. And I know Maine, um, we've already mentioned um, the consumer owned utility that John, I will not steal uh, John's thunder. He will like go into that in much detail, but it's really cool to see Maine taking that on in a really clear way. Um, because I think that, um, community and public ownership are ways for us to confront the corporate control of the energy system that we currently have and build um, something in which we can actually um, expand uh, renewable energy. We can make sure that the benefits are going um, to folks that have been most affected by our current system and like intersecting systems of oppression that Amara also mentioned in her, her notes. And um, I think that that's like an extremely powerful thing. So in rewiring um, our energy system and our renewable energy system, we have a really powerful opportunity um, to ensure that it is going to be grounded in justice and climate justice and ensure that it's, um, you know, building on, it has building blocks of democracy so that we have transparency, so we have participation, so that we aren't seeing um, a renewable system that uh, potentially continues um, systems of extraction in which um, only wealthy far away uh, executives are reaping those benefits. It's something that is like in our community, we see folks who have good unionized jobs that Isabel talked about. We see that, um, you know, we are lowering and limiting pollution. We're seeing that the energy burden that people feel right now in their buildings um, and in like when they get their 
um, utility bills is no longer there. Um, so I think that there are already a good examples of this happening on the ground as um, the um, as tomorrow really showed us too, um, that they, this, this is not something that is um, theoretical, it's happening right now. Um, and just a really good example of that is the work that's happening in Maine and also ones across the country. For instance, um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, there's a group called Cooperative Energy Futures, which works with um, works to put community solar on community centers like churches. And um, in doing so, they are focused on providing 75% of that renewable energy to low income community members, and also are enabling a jobs program of apprenticeships that brings folks who historically may not be in the energy sector or in the renewable energy sector into the fold which builds a huge amount of community wealth. Um, and so that is just one of many examples. Um, so yeah, I think um, I'll like end it at that. I think, you know, this is our chance to really build a new, uh, more resilient um, re energy system that um, reflects justice and reflects equity. And um, also, in order for us to win, I actually think this is super important because, um, you know, I think what can happen if we don't confront those systems of power is that we will continue to see dragging of feet and like how we build movement support and movement power is by um, showing that like we're in this together and there's like there's community behind it. So I think that ownership and in renewable energy is a powerful tool for us to win as as well as like grounded in those uh, beneficial components of like equity and justice. So I will stop there. Thank you so much, Johanna, and like how it all maps over. Also your introduction of John perhaps should just stand on its own. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to welcome John to take um, some time here on our amazing call. Uh, John is a fellow XCOM member, an attorney, a former state rep, um, has been involved in clean elections, um, all different kinds of work about that kind of transparency, how we build better systems um, that really is also part of this fight that then will make for uh, better legislative and political action. So uh, John, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey, and what an honor to be uh, here on this panel with Kate and Amara and Isabel and Johanna. Uh, terrific, terrific uh, presentations, and it's a, it's a real pleasure. I, I will not um, talk at any length about the consumer-owned utility, but I would love to um, come back to that at a future time and do an entire um, webinar on that issue to anybody who's interested, because we are really all in on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about democracy and this is kind of a snapshot of where we are from my point of view. <clears throat> our democracy obviously is coming through one of the most intensive stress tests in our history and like what a ride it was. Um, and some states are actually still counting every vote as we speak. Um, we had a lot of challenges uh, allowing voters to register and cast a ballot safely, uh, fighting back against obstacles to voter participation the record smashing early voting, mostly by mail, all the pressure put on uh, the people who run the elections and the systems and the resources that they rely on. Um, and not to mention, of course, the wide, widespread disruption of uh, many democratic norms that we've seen from um, some of the leaders of this country over uh, the recent years that's, that bled right into our democratic processes. But it really was a remarkable uh, year and election, and especially since COVID hit right as the primaries and the candidate campaigns were gearing up in April and March of this year. Um, but our democracy did well. Um, although we have work to do to break down barriers and to expand inclusion and to fight off um, voter suppression efforts, um, the fears of an election catastrophe, um, logistical or intentional interference in the, in the election uh, did not come to pass for the most part. We were ready for it. Um, but democracy, as you all know, doesn't just happen. Um, it's not like the weather or the sun rising in the morning. It requires our involvement and our engagement. Um, this election cycle, uh, unprecedented, unprecedented numbers of us um, got involved and we took care of our democracy as we should. Um, and we had a reminder through this process of how vitally important it is not just to get good policy enacted um, and to address the challenges around us, uh, but simply to survive 
as a nation and as a planet. Um, this was a real stress test. So congratulations to us all for, for the successes of this year. Um, we also have just concluded the most expensive election cycle in history, not by a little bit, but by a lot. Double the fundraising and spending uh, above uh, wealthy special interests in um, the last uh, election cycle since 2016. Doubled it. Um, the two major presidential campaigns will have spent over a billion dollars each in this cycle. Um, the Democrats actually dominated 6.9 billion to 3.8 billion. Um, Democrats are raising more money in part because women are increasing their giving um, up by 37 percent since 2016. Um, for a total of giving by women of 2.5 billion in 2020. Over 40% of this is large individual donations, 22% is uh, small donations. Um, independent expenditures also exploded up from 1.3 billion in 2016 to 2.6 billion. And large individual contributors like Michael Bloomberg and Sheldon Adelson um, gave um, a, a 642 uh, million to federal super PACs this year. Um, Financial interest gave more to Republicans in the last cycle, but more to Democrats this cycle. A similar pattern occurred in Maine. Anyone who has not been on another planet for the last 12 months certainly knows that the Susan Collins Gideon race was absolutely off the charts in terms of spending. Uh, I was told by one political consultant that they turned down work because they knew that it wouldn't make a difference. There must be a better way for um, people to spend their money. Uh, local races in Maine, although we have clean elections, there's still a lot of money. And there's concerns that there's things that we could do to improve the democratic process and that this money is having an effect. We are examining uh, the need to rein in leadership PACs and caucus PACs. And a big priority for 2021 will be looking at corporate contributions. The federal government banned these um, over 100 years ago, and 22 states have banned corporate contributions, but in Maine, they are still allowed. And we will be working on that as a priority in the coming year major industries that are, that are contributing are pharmaceuticals, financial interests, insurance, real estate, real estate and construction. And on the federal level, HR1, the, Care, the For the People Act, um, campaign finance, ethics and voting rights at the federal level, um, that is gonna be a priority for the next Congress. So let me just say, finally, um, there's some big challenges ahead in, the, in our democracy, but uh, my final word is don't give up. Um, grassroots organizing is a good antidote to the role of big money in politics. Uh, the Sierra Club continues working with groups like League of Women Voters and Maine Citizens for Clean Elections, and your civic participation is really the best way to fight back against this tsunami of big money. Um, the good news, is we passed the stress test, um, but there are challenges ahead. And um, we will need to continue to fight against measures to suppress the vote. We will continue to need to continue to strive to become a more perfect democracy of by and for the people. So that's it. Thank you. You're here. Uh, thank you so much, John, and a great rallying cry for our post-election lives. Um, so, to, so we're making this kind of interesting Venn diagram of all these different issues uh, that are happening at the same time. Um, and we're going to take it from that big political overview to something super granular and held, which is agriculture, um, food justice. Uh, and at the cornerstone of that, I love the Resilience Hub so much. And so it's such a pleasure to introduce Kate Wallace, uh, the program director of Resilience Hub, to uh, tell us about her work. Thanks, Kelsey. And thank you, everybody else who spoke before me. Um, so part of my role at the Resilience Hub is to teach people about permaculture. And um, the most important thing to understand about permaculture is that it is a design system and it weaves together many different disciplines, uh, including ecology and agriculture, uh, regional planning, architecture, um, just to name a few. And so when we're talking about uh, designing using permaculture, we're talking about mimicking natural patterns to create ecosystems that are beneficial for humans as well as all of the other beings uh, with whom we share this planet. Um, and so permaculture essentially shows us that with conscious design, humans can have a positive impact on our environments, which is something that um, I feel like I never learned until I was an adult. I always um, was sort of, it was drilled into my head that um, the less impact humans have on our environments, the better, yeah? But um, to actually think that humans could have a positive impact on our environments was like mind blowing to me. 
Um, and so for those of you who watched the movie, you saw the abundance of the farm Bec Helouin, which is the farm in Normandy, France. And um, the farmers in that movie shared stories about their productivity and what they credit um, is good design as the driving force behind their farm. And at one point, um, one of those farmers references a UN study that covered 68 countries. And he said, if everyone practiced permaculture, productivity could multiply by three or four times what you're seeing on a conventional farm. Since 70% of our food is already being produced by small farmers, we could feed 10 to 12 billion people in the next 20 years by creating millions of small urban farms. This would create millions of jobs, regenerate ecosystems by storing CO2 in the soil, allow farmers to earn more money and produce healthy food for the community. And so um, how would this work, these small urban farms? Um, an urban permaculture micro farm would not look like a conventional farm as we might envision it with straight rows of annual vegetables uh, growing in bare soil. And if you watched the film, that segment on the farm, you caught a glimpse of their edible forest garden. And so one of the things that we do at the Resilience Hub is we help install these kinds of gardens, these forest, edible forest gardens. We've installed many in the greater Portland area and around the state over the past 15 years. And so what we're talking about is um, like layered plants, like vertical growing. So fruit and nut trees as an overstory, um, shrubs in a sort of an under layer, edible shrubs like blueberries or elderberry, um, and then perennial herbs uh, and annual vegetables um, in a sort of lower story and then a ground cover um, like say clover, for example, to fix nitrogen in the soil. Um, and so all of these plants are serving different functions and we're essentially creating these ecosystems, like I said at the beginning, that are useful to both humans and also support the other um, creatures that we're sharing the planet with. So um, habitat for pollinators, food for wildlife and birds, um, at the same time improving the soil and feeding the critters that are living underground, um, which are far more numerous than any of us that are above ground. Um, and then also providing food and medicine and a myriad other benefits for the humans who are engaging with these ecosystems. Um, so converting abandoned lots to food production is a great idea and it works really well in a city like Detroit where there's a lot of vacant land. Um, I was asked to speak about urban agriculture tonight. I want to acknowledge that, you know, obviously the bulk of the state of Maine um, is not urban and um, a lot of these techniques can be um, scaled to uh, different um, acreages and also um, different communities. Um, but so thinking about Portland, Maine, um, you know, Portland, Maine is different, right? Land is a commodity that's harder to come by, especially on the peninsula. Um, the city, however, owns different parcels of land and um, over the years, dedicated volunteers have worked hard to um, populate different areas with these kinds of edible plantings that I'm talking about. One example of this is Mount Joy Orchard, which is a free to pick public food forest in the east end of Portland. Uh, it's managed by a core group of volunteers in conjunction with the city. And it was started seven years ago and now is home to over a hundred different fruit trees that are intercropped with um, in the ways that I described with the various understories. Um, so um, this is a real amazing accomplishment and it's all uh, sort of spearheaded by this group of, of volunteers. Um, much of the work that was done in Mount Joy was accomplished through these community work parties that we call perma blitzes at the Resilience Hub. Um, this is a conjugation of the word permaculture and blitz. And um, for like a five hour work day, anywhere from 15 to 70, we've had over 70 participants show up. Um, people gather on a site and work together to install elements of a permaculture design. And so it's truly like a barn raising blitz. I mean, by the end of the day, you know, you might not even recognize what the site looked like in the morning. And at a perma blitz during normal times, not during pandemic times, we share food together, we meet our neighbors, we learn skills from one another and gain hands on experience with these permaculture practices. Um, and so the Resilience Hub has hosted these perma blitzes both on residential sites and also in public spaces um, like community gardens and schools and city parks. Um, 
And at these perma blitzes, we built new gardens, um, we built herb spirals, grape arbors, chicken tractors, cob ovens, cold frames, vertical growing structures, um, and lots more. Um, so perma blitzes really provide this um, sort of intensive energy and um, transformation um, that wouldn't be possible without all of these hands working together. Um, so I think that all of these pieces, um, I'm trying to paint sort of a, a, a picture of what is possible um, in both of our urban communities, but also in, in rural communities, we've held perma blitzes as well. Um, one more example of a um, possibility for uh, urban agriculture, um, cooperative growing endeavors. So um, in 2004, there was a project started in Portland called the Winter Cash Project, um, where folks got together who wanted to grow a winter food supply but didn't have access to land on which to do it. And so they partnered with a farmer um, just outside of the city and on an acre of land, they grew uh, winter crops and stored them in one of the members root cellars. So it became this sort of community root cellar. And then everybody who participated in the project over the course of the summer um, took food from that root cellar and was able to feed themselves over the winter. Um, so again, you know, what is possible when people come together um, and take control of uh, their food supply and take their food security into their own hands? Um, there's a lot of possibility there. So um, I'll stop there, but uh, I could keep talking about this stuff all day. So thank you <laughs> for having me. We'll keep talking, Kate. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so inspired. Sign me up for Perma Blitz. And uh, just a reminder that Sierra Club, a lot of these organizations or movements that we talk about are activist or volunteer led um, or, or fueled by volunteer labor. Um, and I know that's a little bit hard during the pandemic, but we hope that everybody on this call, uh, when things are safer, if it, you know, we'll consider how they can get involved, whether that's in your own home or in your community volunteering. Um, I, I love the idea of the Perma Blitz barn raiser. So um, I think that's a perfect segue into uh, the, our first question for panelists. Um, just, you know, so much about the heart of this film was about uh, kind of like dismantling this doomsday scenario because of the power of the reimagination of humans. And at the beginning of the film, uh, Rob Hopkins spoke about how uh, perhaps saying that we're bad at imagining uh, prosperity compared to imagining despair, but yet the film features all these amazing folks who are really reimagining things from the roots up. So each of you as people involved in this um, and maybe we can just, I, I would love to do just kind of a round robin for this first question. So maybe we can go in the order uh, that, we, uh, that we did the presentations. Um, what do you think is the role of visioning in our work and what is your vision for the future? I'm gonna hand that to you, Amara, unless you'd like to pass and then uh, let somebody else jump in. Yeah, I, I can start um, with that. Um... I think the vision that I have for this work, um, it's, it's I, I think about it a lot because when I'm engaged in this work, I um, am typically younger than the folks I am working with. And um, when talking about the climate crisis and um, addressing these issues, it is addressing these issues for, um, you know, our sons and daughters, for, um, people who are going to be born and, you know, for students and for youth. And then I think this is addressing the issue, frankly, for myself, because I'm actually going to be alive um, when, you know, things, when these, when this issue um, comes to be in a way that we can't go back from it. Um, so my vision for the future and what that looks like, looks like just I would I would throw it back to education and making sure everyone is aware of these issues, because in being aware of these issues, in knowing what is going on, then folks are more likely to want to spark change, to want to change their actions so that they are not contributing to the issue itself. Um, and I think that is what I would envision my future as a collective um, act by all citizens in addressing this issue. Isabel, do you want to jump in? Yes, I would like to. I really love that question, actually, because it's such an important topic. And it's one that, at least in my world and in, in, in policy, we don't think about it enough. And I think it's because we tend to be a bit backward looking in our analysis. And we don't really appreciate that policy is about problem solving. And problem solving is about 
using imagination and creativity to really think outside the box and, and find solutions to the very tough problems that we face. Um, but I wanted to actually talk about a couple of experiences that I think um, can be inspirational in that regard. Um, I was learning recently about how in Singapore, uh, their policy design process involves hiring fiction writers to help develop a vision of the future that is then used to guide their policy planning, which I think is amazing. And when I was working in Ecuador a while back, uh, we would also start, uh, we had plans, development plans that were about five years long. But before drafting the policy, we would start with drafting a vision for what the country should look like in 30 years, and then work backwards and think about uh, the, the policies and the targets that we needed to hit on the way there. Um, and that was also really clarifying. It helps you like really build alignment and clarity about what you want and, and your priorities. And it also gives you motivation to really work toward realizing that vision. Um, in terms of what that vision actually looks like, uh, I think we have a lot more visioning to do as a movement. And the first thing that came to mind is actually this, this message from the future video that AOC and Naomi Klein put out with The Intercept last year, which was really cool because it paints a really clear picture. It shows bullet trains from New York to DC, a very diverse Congress, clean energy, universal healthcare and childcare, and federal work prog programs for ecosystem restoration and the like. So I think we need a lot more of these kinds of essentially cultural products out there um, that, that are a big part of the narrative element to the political strategy that we should be advancing as a movement. So all for more visioning, um, we need a lot more work there. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. I put the link in the chat. Um, I love that film very much. It was a, also a very short, inspiring thing. Johanna, you wanna jump in? Yeah, um, wow, everything that has been said already is so spot on and I completely agree. And I think like another thing when it comes to this visioning that I think um, is powerful is the fact that like climate is such um, an entity, like the issue of climate and climate justice does intersect in so many different ways, like throughout our um, society, throughout our economy. And so it means that we can't just tinker at the edges. It really does force us to um, pull ourselves out of that framework and like design and like um, do that visioning um, and like think of new systems and not get stuck in like just what we've done before, but to learn from our histories and like build something that's like, um, that's going to work for our current context. So, I mean, I think a, a lot of my vision for um, climate is like to build it beyond um, a frame of like carbon emissions that has been talked about. Um, I think every, a lot, uh, basically everyone on this call has hit on that already, but the fact that we can like think about um, healthcare um, within the context of climate, that we can talk like talk about racial justice within the context of climate, um, and like how that actually unlocks a lot of potential to vision. Um, so it, maybe not a perfect answer to your question, but like when I'm thinking of that visioning, like what what could be unlocked? Tons to vision. Uh, John, you want to talk about something besides the government or what's your vision? For <laughs> yeah, the well, I would just say briefly that um, visioning uh, in my mind happens um, parallel with um, listening and with story with storytelling and propagation of stories. And that's an important part of our work to be doing is to be listening to the stories of other people and incorporating that into our visioning. Um, and I also say that at a time of great disruption, which I think we have been in, um, the flip side of that is the opportunity to make those visions a reality. And for me, my personal vision is uh, a greater sense of community at all levels from neighborhood all the way to the, to the globe itself, a greater sense of connection and community and, re and mutual responsibility for each other. Thank you. That was really beautiful. Uh, Kate, you want to close us out with your vision? Yeah, I, John, that was really well said. And I, I think one thing maybe I would just add to that is, um, you know, more, um, I guess my vision for the future would be uh, a more place-based sort of localized ecological literacy and understanding of 
of where we are and how we are in relationship to um, the different forces that we we interact with as humans that we're not just uh, you know alone and on our own and superior um, on this planet and um, yeah hopefully we'll we'll get there we were we were there at one time in our history so um, I, I hope it's possible to get back there. I hope so too. Um, we're going to jump into some questions for individual panelists and then I'm going to ask for another kind of round robin question. Um, we're going to start with, um, let's see here, um, perhaps with Johanna. Um, we're going to kind of get into May looking at Maine and then looking at external models with each of the speakers. Um, what do you think is limiting renewable energy here in Maine in comparison to places like Iceland or these other reimagining sites that we've seen? And what can we do to change this rhetoric and reimagine things here? Um, yeah, I, I think it's a great, super great question. And um, I think one of the biggest issues is one that uh, John was also hitting on a little bit when it came to our democracy and how um, we have a, in the United States have a particularly huge amount of influence of corporate actors upon our um, upon our democracy. And um, I think that that is, has historically been a major hindrance in us being able to get the things that we want and achieve the goals that we want, um, particularly on climate. And I think that's why um, the fight for consumer owned utility in Maine um, is a really powerful example um, where you all are charting new territory and like how we actually tackle this problem. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, historical examples of like public ownership, but you all um, in, and like community ownership in the energy sector. Um, but this is like a whole state like d taking this type of action so that um, it is reflective of um, folks who live in Maine, I think is going to be very inspiring and something that could, um, by you all following that or like taking that path, chart futures for other people as well in other places that take out that corporate interest in um, basic services and like in this transition that we like desperately need. Um, so I think that, you know, that that would be like a major kind of hindrance that I see that in Maine, you all are actively working um, to find solutions to. Yeah, and I'd love to talk about one of the um, disruptions to non-solutions. Um, John, can you chime in here a little bit with what Sierra Club has been doing with some other community partners and what the, the news is on the fight to stop the CMP transmission line? Well, the um, sure, the just briefly, the um, uh, transmission line is um, still um, one of the top issues and top priorities uh, going forward. And um, the Sierra Club has, has jumped in um, to um, work on uh, a, a legal challenge to that. And I don't know whether it's possible to tag um, Becky to um, unmute her to say a few things here, but um, the, the legal challenge um, is, is are, are you able to be unmuted? Because Becky's the, the yeah, real- I can. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, John. Um, it's not news that we are opposing or working to try to get um, the Army Corps of Engineers to treat us just like all the other states that have um, have tried have had an application from Massachusetts to get um, CMP uh, get Hydro Quebec power down to Massachusetts. Uh, we are. We are fighting to get an environmental impact statement done because there are just too many unknowns about the impact of the state of Maine. It's the most environmentally impactful of the three states in New England. Um, and uh, actually just today we filed, or actually it was yesterday in the end of the day, we filed a preliminary injunction against CMP um, to uh, prevent them from starting construction until uh, the our lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers um, goes forward in the um, in uh, in the courts. So the preliminary injunction was filed yesterday, and um, we are hoping to stop that construction until we can see some environmental um, analysis that's really viable. It's been a very um, opaque um, process. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, summarily removed the requirement that the um, Department of Energy um, 
uh, presidential permit uh, would be part required before there could be forward movement. And uh, that, that happened sometime between July and August. And um, you know that has, has been required and they also, the, the Department of Energy will require a 30 day comment period. And uh, suddenly the Army Corps permit does no longer requires them to have the, the presidential permit. Um, CMP was hoping to start construction on December 4th and we are uh, try to stop that. So that's where we are right now. Thank you so much. And it's really exciting work. I hope if you're uh, that everybody will kind of keep their eyes on the news as this uh, hopefully doesn't move forward and all of these legal actions really um, make some more assessment. So thank you. And I just say one thing, we are working with um, the Appalachian Mountain Club and the Natural Resources Council of Maine on this particular lawsuit. Our Department of Energy lawsuit is independent of them. So yeah. Yeah, coalition building, it's really important. Thanks for giving credit where it's due. Um, I'm gonna ask a question of Isabel um, and thinking about like, you know, we can do legal actions, we can talk about these grassroots movements, um, but a big part of this is also about changing the economy to solve climate change. Um, and so what are some important things for us to consider in our own lives or here in Maine about circular economies and, um, and what we, how we move forward with, it, with a new economy based on renewable energy and different policies? Sure, uh, thanks Kelsey. And I'll preface this by saying that despite my best efforts, I am not knowledgeable enough about Maine specifically, I think to give very tailored recommendations, um, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, and when, yeah, when you mentioned circular economy, I think the main thing that came to mind is this example from, from the, the film that we all watched, uh, where they talk about this very simple thing of recycling in California. And I think the reason that it struck me is because it just reminded me of how much there still is to do in terms of industrial transformation um, that's been on the agenda for a very long time and it's pretty straightforward as a means for realizing a lot of these objectives, in, in this case, the objective of minimizing waste or reducing waste to zero. Um, before I moved back to, this, to the US last year, I actually lived in Berlin for a while and I was really jealous of the recycling system because I never experienced anything like it in the States. They actually put a bin in your house to recycle and compost pretty much everything. They have a bin for glass, a bin for plastics, a bin for carbon paper, a bin for compost. And if you want to make money, you can even just go to your local grocery store and put your plastic and glass bottles in a machine and it pays you. Um, so I'd say that in, in addition to all the really lofty policies that we have to build uh, renewable energy, industry and infrastructure, uh, et cetera, to make our buildings cleaner and more efficient, I think we also have to think about investing in the creation of these less sexy industries like recycling and composting that can actually make a huge contribution to, to stopping ecosystem degradation, and even in the case of composting, to ecosystem restoration. I think Bernie Sanders uh, even had a proposal for a national zero waste initiative uh, of that sort, including a national recycling company. Uh, and I'm, I know that there are plenty of other examples of that sort out there. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to highlight, that I think when we're thinking about industrial investment and investments in economic transformation, there are a lot of very simple accessible things that we can do tomorrow. Um, it would just prioritize them to make a huge difference uh, that would move us quickly to something like circular economy and, and zero waste. Um, but just to, to add to that, I would recommend that if folks have time, the, the jobs report that, that goes along with the Thrive Agenda also has a line-by-line -line description of the kinds of investments that we would need to, to realize our, our climate um, EJ objectives and more. So it gives you lots of examples of, of investments that are much needed and can be easily done. Thank you so much. And you know, the flip side of composting is also good agriculture practices, uh, you know, just end to end a circular good food system. So let's flip it back to Kate, if we can. Um, and the film explored many solutions to food shortages, food deserts, food insecurity. Um, what solutions to these issues do you think are the most important and pressing for us to put our energy behind? Oops, did we lose Kate? Um, well, I'm gonna hop off that, unless one of you wanna jump in and answer too on the panel. Um, I'm gonna uh, then ask my question for Amara, which is, um, 
how do we include uh, climate change in our education system, with especially with young people, um, without making them fearful? Yeah, um, thanks so much, Kelsey, for that question. That is a great question. Um, it it's really hard. I mean, for adults even to learn about this, you know, existential crisis that being climate change. Let alone, let alone, you know, kids. Let alone, you know, high school students and middle schoolers. And um, I think that one thing in you know my educational endeavors when learning about this this issue um, that I focused on that really helped to kind of cope with that um, unknowing, with that uncertainty, with that anxiousness that I felt around this issue is not looking, I guess, at the issue itself, but looking at the climate justice movement, um, looking at how you know youth have really just mobilized around these efforts, millions of youth across the country and empowering students and saying, you know, this is what is being done now, you know, and this is how you can con contribute to the change. This is how you can make sure that these issues, they are not exacerbated. Um, so I think that climate change education is just so needed in our education system. And one way not only to teach about climate change, but to, you know, make sure that youth feel empowered to take action is by highlighting the youth climate justice movement. Thank you so much. Um, and there is, yeah, as our awards were given out to, there's amazing youth organizers here in Maine and it's really exciting to see the, the age of our panel uh, reflect a really, uh, a really diverse <laughs> range um, with youth leaders. So um, I'm going to, if it's all right with everybody, I'm gonna introduce Shenna Bellows who's here to give us a little bit of a talk in, in spirit of keeping on the timeline, but I would hope that people could stay on the call. I saw a bunch of comments and questions um, in the chat, but I, I'd love to stay on track and then um, maybe we can uh, close. And if there's still some good conversation, I could stay and chat with you all and listen to you all for a while. So um, let's bring Shenna into this. Um, I'm so excited to welcome uh, Shanna to the conversation. I met her very briefly a couple of years ago at the Camden International Film Festival. We were both clamoring to speak to the directors of American Factory, um, where I learned about uh, Shanna's kind of passionate and amazing work about labor uh, in Maine and thinking, reimagining labor in the 21st century in the wake of environmentalism and, you know, with equity at the heart of it. Um, she is the executive director of the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine. She was the longtime executive director of ACLU of Maine for eight years um, and is the state senator for Senate District 14. Um, and so I welcome her to share her story and join us in this uh, conversation. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And since we're all on Zoom and we're not in a room, I want um, everyone to do a big stretch and sort of a cheer, like, yay, Sierra Club. This is the best group ever. <laughs> and I'm gonna do a start um, with a couple of thank yous. And I'm gonna invite you at home to be like, yeah, um, as I'm um, just thanking and congratulating a couple of people to start before I get into um, what Sarah Leighton asked me to speak about. So first, this is just an incredibly uplifting um, and innovative annual meeting. I'm so grateful and inspired. Um, so your first yay to the award winners and the Maine Youth Climate Justice, uh, to Jim Fritt, to representatives Nicole Grahowski and Seth Barry. You are amazing, strong, smart principal leaders making change. Yay! <laughs> Let's give everybody a great big, big round of applause, or you can do reactions on your Zoom, thumbs up or hand clapping. You know, last night, my husband and I watched Tomorrow. And uh, when it started, he said, uh-oh. He said, I thought you said this was an uplifting movie. And I said, I promise it is. And what really stood, stayed with me was, was what Kelsey described about visioning possibility. That's what the film does. So earlier this year, I happened to share um, what a profound impact all of you at Sierra Club Maine chapter had on me for my first moment in electoral politics and how that shaped the work I do today, gave me the strength to carry on and so I shared that just in a, in a personal um, sharing and your wonderful chapter director, uh, Sarah Leighton asked me to 
share that with you tonight. So I do want to say that my first partnership with Sierra Club Maine was back in 2011. Um, as the film demonstrated, voting rights and democracy reform are fundamental to everything else that we do. And when in 2011, then Governor Paula Page signed into law a repeal of Maine's longstanding same day voter registration law, the grassroots, it was the people that sprung into action. I co-chaired a people's veto campaign in 2011. Um, 22 progressive groups joined the fight. Sierra Club main chapter was there from the beginning, recognizing that democracy is fundamental to everything else that we do. And we won. So that was my first taste of partnership with Sierra Club Maine and all of you who are so active, knocking on doors, canvassing for signatures, canvassing for votes, talking to friends and neighbors and making positive change. So then I took on Sierra, Susan Collins. Um, I launched my campaign in 2013. Sierra Club was the first and only Maine-based environmental group to back me. I can't tell you how much that meant to me personally but more importantly, to the activists I was working with, we were desperate at the time to stop the Keystone Pipeline, something I opposed and Susan supported. We saw ourselves as representing this grassroots movement, so alarmed by the acceleration of climate change and ready to stand up and fight. So losing to Collins wasn't unexpected, but it was hard. It was really hard and seeing LePage reelected that year as well, just so dispiriting. I might have been discouraged. I might have given up. Electoral politics can be brutal. And then Sierra Club did something remarkable. Your leadership at the time invited me to come to your 2014 annual meeting at Bowdoin College to be a keynote speaker. And that was an incredible gift um, to someone who had just lost so publicly and dramatically but not because you asked me to speak, but because of that day in workshops on concrete actions that we could take to make a difference on community solar projects, community gardens, passenger rail. I came to speak, but I left inspired to act. I had just started my own small business consulting to nonprofits. Sierra Club was my first client. The challenge to convince Republicans in the legislature to back a feasibility study to explore passenger rail from Portland to Lewiston, a study sponsored by then Representative Jared Golden. What was so cool about that work was I got to see all of you in action. Sierra Club members do a lobby day that is phenomenal. Sierra Club members were determined and eager to talk to everyone even though we were talking about a half a million dollar feasibility study for a big dream, right? Passenger rail in Maine, something that we continue to work toward. The study passed out of transportation committee and then it got included in the budget. But we thought we were done for because Paul LePage, he had a Christmas tree and he put these little pigs on the Christmas tree identifying specific, in his mind, pork projects. And he identified the passenger rail study as something that he was going to block. Well, Sierra Club members flooded the phones, flooded the members of the legislature that year with calls, and we were able to get it passed with one big caveat. The study passed, the state agreed to put up $400,000 for the study, but it had to be matched by a combined $100,000 from Lewiston and Auburn. Again, Sierra Club members stepped up, contacting city councilors, working, doing power mapping and community organizing to convince the city councilors and the two Republican mayors of the Twin Cities to envision a better future and invest in that study. And you, Sierra Club, yet again, won under very difficult conditions. Fast forward to 2016, there was an opportunity to run for state Senate, my state Senate district, um, and Sierra Club was there to back me. In a year that Trump won my state Senate district, I also won my state Senate district because of volunteers, um, Sierra Club members in my district who drove me door to door and together we knocked on 10,000 doors. I served in the minority in the state Senate in 2016. I got my heart broken as all of us did 
with the defeats of some critical bills like the solar bill that year. But you didn't give up. Sierra Club activists never gave up. Sierra Club was an incredibly important presence in Augusta that year, holding the legislature and holding the governor accountable and then working to win a pro-environment majority in 2018. And that's yet another time that I saw Sierra Club shine. Because there's a real question in advocacy, right? In activism, what's your approach? Do you settle or compromise your ideals for what people perceive as possible in the interest of winning? Or do you stand up on principle? Do you envision what is possible? Do you have big ideas and then fight hard to realize them? You know, the right wing describes something that they call the Overton window, which is to move the center of public discussion by standing up on pure principle. And maybe you don't get what you want, but you move that window toward the center. And I saw time and time again, Sierra Club's adherence to principle imagining the change we'd like to see in this world in a big way. Representative Chloe Maximum won a Republican district that year in 2018. This time she defeated Maine's assistant majority leader and one she'll be serving in the Senate. But she had the courage to introduce a Green New Deal for Maine and Sierra Club activists backed her every step of the way. And here a first year legislator with a big idea got it passed because of people like you. So as we look to the future, what's next? In my day job, I run the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine. Founded by Holocaust survivors in 1985, we have a mission to inspire people to really confront prejudice and discrimination. And I think what Sierra Club is recognizing, what we're all beginning to recognize is that systemic racism, that white supremacy and oppression are blocking positive change, big change, to on the environment, on every front, really. My nephew, he's two years old. He's named Calvin John Muir Bellows. That's right, John Muir, like the founder or one of the founders of Sierra Club. My brother and his wife bonded over their love of the West Coast, West Coast Mountains. And to this day, they're always finding the highest, most challenging peaks they can climb. So I paid attention when Sierra Club did something incredibly hard and incredibly important, challenging a beloved figure in your movement, John Muir, for his racist words and actions that harmed black, indigenous and people of color. It takes an extraordinary organization to re-examine and confront its own mythology to confront its founding story, its founder, and to confront white supremacy. And make no mistake, Sierra Club is an extraordinary organization because that work, we can't just confront those with whom we disagree. We can't just confront the other, the enemy. We have to confront ourselves and systemic racism and oppression in ourselves. So now I have a question for you I asked Sarah if it was okay, and the executive committee authorized me to, to, to ask this question a few times in a few different ways. It's a really important question, and I want you to think about it seriously. I've shared with you how Sierra Club has been a partner and a supporter and really inspired me to be better, to do more, to try harder, even when at first we don't succeed. So here's my question. What is your vision for the future? The panel tonight was incredible. What is your vision for the future? Is it what Amara said, a collective act by all citizens in addressing these issues? Will you be alive when climate change reaches a point we can't go back? Or will your children or your grandchildren? Can you commit a gift of time or money to Sierra Club tonight. Some of you have already made your end of year donation to Sierra Club. Can you go online tonight and make yet another gift? What is your vision for the future? 
Here's the link. Great job, Sarah. It's right there in the chat. <laughs> you can just click it. <laughs> what is your vision for the future? Isabel asked, what will the country look like in 30 years? Have you taken the time to imagine what will your home, what will your property, what will our state, what will our country look like in 30 years? What could it look like? Could it be a vibrant, amazing garden? Like what we saw in the film and the work that Kate is doing? Well, to make that happen, can you give a gift tonight to Sierra Club of $1 or $10 or $100 to contribute to that vision? What's your vision of the future? Do you believe, as Johanna said, that the issues of climate change and climate justice intersect in so many different ways throughout our society and our democracy? Can you give a gift tonight to Sierra Club to support climate justice? Seriously, what is your vision for the future? Do you believe, as John said tonight, that it's a greater sense of connection and community and mutual responsibility for each other. Can you make a gift tonight to support Sierra Club, to create community, to create connection, to make change? And finally, I ask, what is your vision for the future? Is it a concrete action like what Kate is leading to grow food locally, to create communities that can feed ourselves and our people and end hunger? You know, I grew up poor without electricity or running water until I was in the fifth grade. As a free lunch kid. So I think a lot about how we feed our communities and how we end hunger. Can you make a gift tonight to support Sierra Club's work for true sustainability? There's a $12,000 challenge for Sierra Club tonight going on right now for every dollar, even if it's just $1 or $5, really grassroots power, or $100 or more, even $1,000 if you could, if you have that means. That gift will be matched tonight up to $12,000. And over the next few days, if, for justice, for equity, for our future, I encourage you to give. And from the very bottom of my heart, I just want to say, Sierra Club has changed my life for the better. And Sierra Club has helped to build lasting and positive change in our state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can uh, turn their video on and maybe we can give a round of applause for Shenna and all of our panelists. Um, just tremendous. Uh, and I hope you go to gallery view and see everybody clapping. Um, it's a beautiful group of people we have here. Thank you so much for all being on this call. Um, I'm gonna ask one last question of, um, of our panel. Um, and I just want to remind everybody, you know, November 4th, we officially exited the Paris Climate Agreement. There is tons of work still to be done. We can do it in our daily lives. We can do it, whether that's us as individuals uh, in an equity-centered coalition um, with energy democracy or with community agriculture. There are so many steps we can take. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to our panel about what they want your takeaway for one step you can take um, to help build a better future and vision a world or realize a vision for our world. So um, whoever wants to jump in, we, will, we don't have to go in a specific order. I can jump in first, I guess. Um, and I would just say, I mean, oh, it's hard to follow after Shanna gave that incredible speech. Oh my gosh. Um, and I completely agree. I think one of the things I heard Shanna say is to like get organizing and like plug in. And um, this seems like such an incredible group of people to do that plugging in with. Um, so I think that's like definitely a key takeaway is plug in so you can make that, um, that vision a, a reality. Yeah, I was I was thinking something very similar. Um, find your 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 nearest climate action team and get involved. Sign up, volunteer, and if there isn't one where you are, then start one. Yeah, and just piggybacking on that, I think also something that I've been thinking about lately is how we bring more people to the movement. So maybe one challenge that we can set for ourselves is just talking to someone that's not plugged in and has no interest in plugging in, but it's because maybe they're discouraged and they just don't know what what there is out there that they could be plugging into. So maybe that's something we can all do. I haven't done it. So I'll set the challenge for myself. 
Yeah, and just tying into um, everything that's been been said, um, I think that there is no definition of who is supposed to be supposed to be involved in this work. Everyone is supposed to be involved in this work um, because together that's how we can make the systems change. So from the youngest little kiddos um, to um, some older folks, I think that just one thing that should be known is that um, we're all in this together and that's how we can make this change. Awesome, great. Chenna, do you wanna chime in? Um. I just, I, I love what Amari just said that everyone can be involved. And I guess I would just say, don't give up, right? You know, we're in this um, really time of this, that of disruption and sometimes despair and people we love are getting sick and people we care about are dying. Like that is, that is very dark. And, and everyone on this call recognizes the threat that climate change poses, but despair and fear are not good motivators for action. So don't give up, keep working. You know, I remember in 2014, sorry, I'm going on for a minute, but in 2014 in that solar panel, somebody mentioned that there's a cap on who could participate in a community solar farm. And I was like, that is so crazy. And, you know, they're like, yeah, well, unfortunately it doesn't look like it's gonna change, but we're gonna try. Well, last year we signed into law, huge solar energy bill. We got rid of that cap. So it's, you know, you just can't give up just because you lose the first time. True story. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, please find the link again to donate. Um, if you are uh, digitally averse, our uh, address is PO Box 1374 Yarmouth, Maine, uh, 04096. I will stick that in the chat as well. Um, we want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, and I've been told that we've been collecting a resource guide that's going to be distributed with some further answers, local resources and national resources um, to look at on all these different issues that the film brought up. Thank you to all of our speakers and making time tonight to join our coalition. Uh, this work is so important now more than ever. And hopefully we're on to uh, a whole new frontier in 2021. Um, thank you all and good night. That was really great, Sarah. Thank you so much.